Hello, it's Scott Manley here with part three of the most Kerbal spacecraft ever. And, well, it's time to actually build a rocket, which actually makes marginally more sense. Because, you see, submarines are designed to operate in an environment which is isolated from the atmosphere of the Earth. They're designed to keep their crew alive. They have a high, you know, very powerful source of power. They're able to handle pressures, albeit they're able to handle uh, pressures coming in against them rather than to escaping from the inside. But regardless, it would seem that if you could put a nuclear sub into space, that it would at least operate until, well, uh, it had no more cooling water. Let's forget about that right now. We are basically strapping rockets all over this thing, and you can see where this is going. <laughs> In fact, you don't need to see the whole thing, you just need to see the end product. Look at this magnificent chariot of the god. It looks like a giant cigar with, I don't know, a bunch of lawn spike things stuck around it. I don't know. It, um... Well, it doesn't move very fast, in part because that central body is something like three and a half thousand tons with all the fuel involved and it only has a pair of really, really tiny engines in there. The external boosters aren't having fuel fed into inside of them. Those are just to get this thing off the ground, but we all know what's going to happen when this thing stages, don't we? We've been here before, but once again we come to this place so we can appreciate the glory of the destruction, so we can worship at the church of the rapid, unplanned disassembly. Yes, not everything made it onto the second stage like we had hoped. And everything's starting to slow down, but so yeah, let's uh, start ditching more stuff. Oops, once again. Nope, let's ditch that. And no, 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 we definitely have to ditch that thing. Well, now we're left with a 3,000 ton submarine, which is now feeling the full force of gravity. And surprisingly, with the power of those vector engines, it is in fact possible to keep it descending backwards. It isn't possible to particularly slow the descent, but no, this thing is going to descend backwards in the orientation that it's been ordered to maintain. Look at it! Beautiful balanced on its tail. When I say balanced, it's balanced while falling, but you know, it looks it looks really, really good, I have to say. If only those engines were just a little more powerful. I do like the way that this is falling so fast, it's actually passing debris that had fell off previously. Wow. And uh, yeah, we're in one of those amazing moments where the space center is getting bombarded from above. The as the runway, of course, explodes because it is made of explodium, right? Well, after many false starts, once again we come back to the solution of perhaps cutting some of the fuel from the core uh, vehicle. <laughs> the the mass of that central body is just so much about the fuel. So what we do is we cut the mass down a little, then we strap on a ton of these boosters, just enough to perhaps give it enough vertical speed so that when we detach them, the vehicle will be able to continue in orbit. Instead of only having two of those uh, vector engines, we decide to put a whole eight of them on there. Again, vector engines are really good for keeping things that are terribly balanced in a straight line because their uh, vectoring capabilities are second to none. Now you might think that with only 800 meters per second of velocity and only half a G of thrust to weight ratio, this thing would not make it into orbit, but by very carefully picking an ascent path which maximizes the loft time, we can in fact get this thing into a stable orbit. It is not an efficient way to do it. You ideally want to always be thrusting along your velocity vector. But sometimes doing that would result in your velocity vector falling back to the planet and the spacecraft with it. There was a recent Atlas V launch where the first stage burned out five seconds early. So the second stage immediately went into compensation mode, essentially angling up from the surface to maintain its uh, vertical speed for as long as possible. It did in fact make it to orbit, but if that first stage had dropped power one second earlier, it would not have made it all the way there. But I have learned well from the ULA, and I am, uh, 
Well, I am maintaining this very high attitude, this very high angle, and finally you notice the time to apoapse starts to rise. So at this point, I can start to bring the nose down. Uh, wait, no, it's a, it's a submarine. I don't bring the nose down, I bring the bow down. Actually, now I'm looking at it, if it is a nuclear-powered submarine, I just wonder how well it would operate when... Uh, the gravity is at 90 degrees to its usual orientation. I mean, I guess a submarine should be able to handle extreme ranges of angle, so the reactors are probably designed for that. But yeah, now we have it into orbit. We have one destination in mind. We shall go to the moon. It looks like we have plenty of delta V here. Three kilometers per second of delta V should get us to the moon, get us into orbit, get us to the surface, and hopefully get us back home. Although whether we can land this thing is still something I have yet to test, and I will, I will enjoy testing it. Unfortunately, the pilot may disagree, but they're just going to have to come along for the ride. Incidentally, the visuals mod that I'm using is the stock visual enhancements mod with the scatterer mod. It seems to do a pretty good job, although I kind of would like some more ambient light sometimes. Yes, yes, realism is very nice, but sometimes you actually want to see the spaceships that you're showing off here. Uh, <laughs> now, off we go on our voyage to the moon. We should call this the Nautilus. I do think it's cool that the first world's first nuclear submarine was named after a fictional submarine from a Jules Verne novel. Anyway, the biggest problem with this spacecraft is just its ability to turn and get pointed in the right direction. We use a lot of reaction control thrusters here to keep this pointed, and sometimes just firing up these engines gives you much more control authority to get what you want. There we go, 2,000 kilometers per second, and do you see what I see? I see a canyon. This is a submarine, isn't it? We want to make like the Red October and race this thing through canyons because it's a challenge. Why not? I don't know. It's not like we're trying to lose anyone in space. There is no stealth in space. Just trying to thread this very big ship through this very, well, this relatively narrow needle. Traveling at uh, 500 meters per second. Velocity is actually now above orbital velocity. <laughs> Altitude above the surface is about one kilometer. But we are coming up to a very, very narrow space here. Watch the watch the altitude drop. And 1,000. We are well below 900 meters, 800. Oh, wow, I could have totally gone even lower there. I was such a wuss. Well, never mind. We can try that again sometime. Faster and deeper and harder and all those other things. Let's try landing this. Why not? Of course, to make this thing faster for the viewers, we are just playing this at four times regular speed. This means you don't have to listen to any of the lame jokes that I tried to figure out while flying a giant submarine and landing it. Instead, you get to listen to the lame jokes that I didn't actually think of. I don't know, I don't have anything funny to say. This is basically a giant submarine. It kind of speaks for itself, doesn't it? Now that we've burned a lot of the fuel, it's actually a much more sprightly vehicle than it once was. Able to turn practically on a dime. And without all those pesky problems of having to blow ballast. And that's not the only changes we had to make. We also strip out the sonar systems and replace them with some proper radar systems. Because after all, there is no sound in space. And those sonar pings, it could be pinging the pinginest uh, pings and they wouldn't be helping it very much. But here we are coming down, very carefully, landing and then attempting to balance here. Look at this. How long can we maintain landing on the moon? The good news is we can't actually get out, so we're not going to try and get out, but I think we're going to actually take off now. Off we go. Off we go back into orbit. That was a successful mission to the moon. Now, can we successfully return to Kerbin? Well, those of you with the skills such as simple math and orbital mechanics would know that I had the Delta V capability to put myself on a transmunar return orbit. However, the real question in your mind was, what happens to a submarine when it hits the atmosphere at 3 kilometers per second without a heat shield? Well, first of all, the reaction control systems all explode. They go off like firecrackers all over the joint. 
Very exciting, very impressive until you actually die. But now, what you really want to know is, imagine it was ablatively heat shielded and was in fact able to fly through the atmosphere. What are the aerodynamic properties of a submarine in this configuration without those giant wings that I was attaching to it earlier? Well, let's find out. We have a little tailplane there, we have some reaction control thrusters, and we have the debug menu set to ignore maximum heat. So this thing can slice through the atmosphere with the greatest of ease. Almost too much ease because it's going way too fast. Also note that the controls for this are inverted, so I'm actually pushing my nose down, sorry, pushing my bow down, which actually means pushing my bow up. For some reason the model is back to front, either that or this is some weird submarine that has the conning tower on the bottom. It wouldn't be a tower if it was on the bottom, would it? You'd call it the conning basement? I don't know. Anyway, uh, yeah, lifting the nose up there by burning a little bit of my uh, main thruster fuel, allowing me to flare and slow down, but unfortunately that does have the habit of pushing my nose back down and I'm trying to find a balance here where I don't crash and I'm about to hit the water and... Oh! Actually surviving by some bizarre miracle, probably because the mass of this thing was so low. Yes! We, in fact, did return this successfully. All I turned on was the heat shielding. I didn't turn on the parts, unbreakable parts, so that is legit. I flew a submarine back from space without any, uh, any wings. Well, except those little tail fins. We'll see some more Kerbal stuff in the next episode. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.